Hey everyone, this is Nick and Gnome42 will release tomorrow. I have given it a good solid few days to try it out and there are a lot of changes that will either please you or make you rant even more against the Gnome developers. There are new themes, more dark modes, Libid Vita, app updates and changes that virtually don't change anything. So stick around and let's give it a good look. Just like I want you to give a good look to your internet connection, thanks to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safing, and you might already have heard me talk about their Portmaster tool on the channel. It lets you monitor and control any detail of your internet connection with a simple graphical user interface through the use of block lists, profiles depending on your current connection, and per app settings. It's also completely free of charge and open source, but Safing is also developing the SPN, the Saving Privacy Network. It's a powerful VPN alternative which spreads your connections across the globe instead of rerouting all your connections to only one server. With the SPN, you can be everywhere at once. So just head over to the link in the description below and download either the Portmaster or subscribe to the SPN. So let's begin with the changes on the desktop side of things, because there are plenty. GNOME 42 brings a revamped shell theme. The small arrows that linked each shell pop-up to their parent element are now gone. In their place, each pop-up now sits closer to the top bar. I'm not sure I find that change to be for the better, as having a clear link to the element you clicked on is always good practice. But since you still get a highlight over what you clicked on, and you know you actually just clicked on that element, it also doesn't make things confusing. It also makes the whole desktop feel a bit lighter with less visual clutter. Elements in each menu are now highlighted with a rounded shape more in line with the rest of the desktop, and submenus are now more closely linked to their parent option with a nice rounded card over the whole menu. Those menus do feel like they have more padding around them though. The on-screen display elements or OSD are also a lot smaller, taking that pill shape that other elements have, and being generally a lot less invading of your screen real estate. They're still very visible, but they won't jump at you anymore. These aren't revolutionary changes by any means. They look good, they are more coherent, but unless you're a huge UX or UI nerd like me, you probably won't notice. And if you are, then you'll probably be pleased. Dark mode support is also now present without the need for GNOME tweaks. The new Appearance Preferences panel now gives you the option to switch from light to dark mode, just like most distros built on top of GNOME already provide. This is implemented in a more standards-friendly way though, as dark mode support is now a free desktop specification that is cross-desktop. KDE Plasma, Pantheon and GNOME all support the same preference, so apps that take advantage of that preference will respect your dark mode, whatever the toolkit or the library they use. Of course, older apps might not pick up on it just yet, their developers will have to implement support for it. Flatpak applications can also benefit from it if they support that preference. Switching from light to dark mode has a nice smooth transition effect added to it, so it's not too jarring. And if you use a stock GNOME wallpaper or one that has a dark variant, it will also be switched accordingly. These dual mode wallpapers are all visually identified with the split look in the background selector. I think it's the right way to implement the dark mode preference as it is. Some people will probably be angry that older apps or not all apps can actually turn dark when you want them to go dark, but it also means that no application will be broken visually by switching to dark mode even though their developer has never planned for it. Now I just hope that toolkit and application developers take advantage of it really fast because I like having eyes and a huge white window popping up on my whole dark desktop kinda makes my eyes want to leave my skull. Then there's libadvita. Gnome 42 is the first version to actually be built with libadvita at its core. GNOME 41 did ship a few apps that used it, but now a lot more of the default applications take advantage of that standardized library. What it brings though is also a new refined GTK theme for default GNOME, and I must say it looks miles better than the previous one. Most big buttons and tabs are now in line with the header bar and don't have a big shape around them. On hover, there's definitely a soft button shape still visible around each element, and selected ones are also clearly visible. Menus also have a whiter background by default on the light theme. In the various menus, the highlights when hovering over an item are way more noticeable. Search fields feel less heavy with a less delineated box around them. And in the various pages of the applications, each element is now on a rounded card with a soft shadow underneath it, 
which makes things pop a bit more, and I find it more legible. Some items have gained small arrows to indicate there's something you can further configure when clicking on it. And in list views, the blue highlights for selected items have been replaced by rounded grey ones, which are definitely more elegant, but also a little less legible. Radio buttons and sliders are also slightly larger, without the thin black stroke that was around them before. It's all going to be very personal, whether you like that change, or you prefer the older one, or you still think that both looks still look like crap. I personally think that it looks more modern, it looks more elegant, and it's really good if you have good eyesight. But people that have visual impairments might find it a lot less legible and a lot harder to actually notice the buttons and the highlights. Purely UI and UX wise, I don't think it creates problems because buttons are still very visibly buttons and on your smartphones these days you generally don't have a huge button shape around the things you can click. They're just text that you tap on. And people are just used to that. I don't think that's an issue. But if you have trouble seeing, if you have problems with your eyesight, it might not be the best. A lot of apps have been migrated to Lib at Vita, like the GNOME Tour, the Calendar, GNOME To Do, the Font Manager, the Disk Usage Analyzer, the Clocks app, GNOME Software, GNOME Contacts, or the Weather app, as well as the Settings app. But some are not there yet, especially the File Manager. Although it might just be Fedora 36, the distro I used to test drive GNOME 42, that decided to use a GDK3 based version of Nautilus instead of the GDK4 and Lib at Vita beta that is already available. Still, that creates a consistency issue because apps that haven't been updated use the older GTK theme and that doesn't look quite right. Most third-party apps will also not have been updated just yet, so expect a GNOME 42 cycle with less consistency while people update their stuff. I must say, as a big nerd, I find this change a little bit jarring. I love having a super consistent desktop where every app looks the same, uses the same style sheet, the same theme, the same look, the same header bars, and GNOME 42 doesn't provide that anymore. It's, it's a bit of a problem, but also a lot of people have told me that I am completely dumb for wanting visual consistency, so maybe I'm a dumb nerd. In any case, I just wish GNOME had provided a GDK3 theme that looks exactly like the new Libet Vita one, so it could bridge the gap while apps get updated. And of course, the community is already on that, which means that you can download a very close to Libet Vita theme and use it using GNOME Tweaks. But on the other hand, you can't change the theme of Libet Vita apps using GNOME Tweaks anymore. So if you liked your apps not using the default Advita look, it's going to be painful, while smarter people than me try and figure out a way to actually enforce another style sheet than the Lib Advita one. Also, thankfully, the beige folders are gone. They're now blue, and they look so much better. It makes a giant difference in how you use your file system. I can't overstate that. It might look like a small and stupid change, but it's the first time in years that the default GNOME theme has not used that horrible beige color and I couldn't be happier. Final detail, Libadvita makes everything a little bit more zippy and smooth, especially in the in-app animation department. Things slide and move in a way better fashion, thanks to GPU acceleration in GDK4. It really does make quite a difference. The tracker indexer that powers the powerful GNOME shell search has also seen a lot of work, and it should use half the memory it once did, which will please system monitor nerds and owner of potato computers alike. They were also working on triple buffer implementation to make the GNOME shell feel a lot faster and a lot smoother as well, especially on older integrated GPUs like Intel ones, but this change didn't make the cut for GNOME 42 itself, although distributions have the ability to add it back with a patch like Ubuntu 22.04 will do. GNOME 42 also has tons of improvements to its default apps. The first one is Files, the file manager. As I said, I used Fedora to test GNOME 42, so it's using a version of Files 42 that still uses GDK3 and its older look. Whether your distro will actually ship with a Libet Vita version of Nautilus 42, I don't know. What did you think? I'm not omniscient, and the internet doesn't seem to have an easy to find answer about which version of Nautilus will ship in default GNOME 42. So shame on you, internet. I expected more from you. Still, both the GDK3 and GDK4 variants should bring the same updates to the app itself. The first one is the new path bar. It shows more of the path in the same space, and it also displays these all-important forward slashes that denote how a Linux file system works. And I like it. It's also clearer that the path is longer than what the window can actually display if the window size isn't large enough to accommodate the whole path. 
And there's also a new path bar menu that gives you the same options as a right click inside the folder itself. I'm not exactly sure why this thing is there because you have the right click, but maybe it's for older Mac users that never had two buttons on their mice, if these guys still exist. Oh, and you also still need to press Ctrl plus L to actually be able to type a path in the path bar, which still sucks. You also get a bigger rename pop-up, which should let you type longer file names. And the undo and redo menu options are now in the main menu instead of being in the sorting menu, which makes more sense, I guess. Now, not exactly an app itself, but the screenshot tool has also been completely revamped. It's no longer an application with its own window. It appears as an on-screen display element. It offers the same three options to capture a selection, to capture the whole screen or a specific window. And you can also toggle a video recording of the screen, which is super handy for people reporting bugs like I do in my freelance job. You have the option to hide or show the mouse pointer, and you can press the big recording button or hit enter to take the screenshot. The tool did lose the option to take a delayed screenshot, which sucks because that was super useful. The older screenshot tool is still available to install if you preferred it, but I found the new one pretty cool. You can invoke it using the print screen key and then you get every option you need. It's neat. There are also two new apps that come as default. The first one is Console, which is replacing the default terminal app. It's simpler than its counterpart with way fewer options and is just there for users that want or need to type a command line or two. The bigger, more featureful terminal app is still available for people who want more power. There's also a new text editor that replaces gedit and has the same exact goals. Be simpler with the more powerful alternative available. I honestly can't say I understand why these apps needed to exist in the first place. Terminal and gedit were already very, very simple and I don't see why we should ship as default something that has way fewer options when the interface of gedit and terminal were never confusing in the first place. But distros still get to pick which apps they want to ship by default, so don't worry, GNOME devs aren't trying to force you to use simpler applications. You'll still get to pick them if you want to. Another small change is GNOME Web, having hardware accelerated rendering by default, which does make it feel a lot faster than it used to, although it still has other flaws that I highlighted in a previous video. And to complete this tour, the GNOME settings have been very slightly tweaked when they were ported to GDK4. Notably in the Displays panel, which doesn't have a separate tab for Nightlight, it's just another option in the main panel, and the Remote Desktop dialog, which now defaults to RDP instead of VNC. GNOME 42 is cool. It's a major step for that desktop environment, because it's the first time users will be confronted with the dreaded libadvita. Much has been written and said on the internet about this thing, and despite amazing people trying to make videos to clarify how this thing works, there's still a lot of confusion floating around about what it means for developers, for users, for user theming, and stuff like that. So this first complete implementation in GNOME 42 will set things straight for a lot of users, and they'll actually be able to see what it means in terms of theming. It will definitely piss off some people that were used to completely theme the way their GDK desktop looked, because that's not feasible anymore for now, unless some developers find a way to actually change the whole style sheet on top of libadvita. I, for one, can appreciate the benefits it brings. The Advaita theme is now good enough, in dark and in light mode, to be a daily driver for most people. The new blue folder icons round up the look, and I think it's quite nice to the eye. It also enables developers to make apps that don't break randomly in terms of how they look. And since it uses GDK4, it also makes them a lot zippier and smoother, thanks to GPU acceleration. We will also have to wait and see if this also improves battery life, because using the CPU to do graphical tasks is way less efficient than using the GPU, so maybe this will bring a change as well. The applications themselves didn't change much, and those changes are take it or leave it for me, but I'm still very excited to get an upgrade to Fedora 36 next month and play with all these new features as my daily driver. Just like I'm super excited to tell you about today's sponsor that will let you get your Linux laptop or desktop super easily. Slimbook does just that. They're based in Valencia, Spain, they ship worldwide, they've got all keyboard layouts that you might want, and they have amazing options for your laptops or your desktops. For example, the Slimbook One, which has a wonderful Mac Mini-like aluminium enclosure with powerful AMD graphics and AMD CPUs, it's just a fantastic device. It's cute, it looks nice, it won't take too much space on your desk, and it's still powerful enough to do most of the things you might want to do, especially gaming. It still works for that. 
So click the link in the description if you need a new device. Slimbook not only has the Slimbook One, but they have plenty of laptops for every budget range and every need. The link is there, click it, order your stuff. Now thanks everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to send me your firstborn son through the mail, or whatever else helps to make those videos more discoverable, I guess. If you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. And if you want to help support what I do, you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to the same weekly Patreon cast and the same rights to vote on the next topics I will cover. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!